Chernobyl, a million casualties. Next on Enviro Close Up. Welcome to Enviro Close Up. I am Carl Grossman. This coming April 26th marks the 25th anniversary of the Chernobyl nuclear plant disaster. Meanwhile, the nuclear industry worldwide is pushing for a revival of nuclear power, and this very important book has been published Chernobyl Consequences of the Catastrophe for People and the Environment, and it concludes based on now available medical data that between 1986, the year of the accident, and 2004, 985,000 people died as a result of the disaster, and more have been dying since. With us is Dr. Janet Sherman. She's the contributing editor of this book, which was authored by a noted Russian biologist, Dr. Alexei Yablakov, Vasily Nesterenko, and Alexei Nesterenko. They're both from Belarus. Welcome, Janet. How did these people die? I mean, we're talking a million people dead from this nuclear plant accident. How? They died of multiple different kinds of diseases, from cancer to heart disease, brain damage, uh, thyroid cancer, but many, many children died in utero, in other words, before they were born, or died of birth defects after they were born. How did these scientists determine 985,000 deaths as a result of Chernobyl? Based on medical data that were available to the scientists. Now, what we've heard, frankly, since the accident from the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is the the global group which is supposed to, to regulate and promote nuclear power. The casualties of Chernobyl, well, currently the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, on its website says maybe in all be 4,000 people dead. Now that's quite different from 985,000. Why this, this discrepancy? Well, they released a report uh, called the Chernobyl Forum, and they only included about 350 articles uh, available in the English language. But Dr. Uh, Yablokov and uh, the two Nestorenkos looked at uh, well over 5,000 articles, and uh, abs the people who were actually we hate to use the term, but boots on the ground. People who were there and saw what was going on. Uh, we're talking about uh, medical doctors, scientists, veterinarians, um, epidemiologists who saw what was happening when people in their communities were getting sick and dying. There's another international agency, the World Health Organization, WHO. And indeed, the book charges that the truth has not come out on Chernobyl from the WHO. I mean, forget about the IAEA, but from the WHO because of a, an agreement between these two agencies. Can you elaborate on that agreement? They formed an agreement in 1959 that has not been changed, where one will not release a, a, a report without the agreement of the other. Now, this is like having Dracula guard the blood bank because the WHO, who is charged with World Health Organization, is beholden to the IAEA before they can release a report. And what the IAEA, I mentioned before, it's, it's there to regulate nuclear technology around the world, but it was also set up to promote it. Promote it. Uh, and it evidently does not want anything from WHO, which would... Uh, indicate that nuclear power is not good for, for one's health. That's right. And this needs to be ended. This agreement needs to be stopped. Let, let me go right to you. Now, you've devoted your life to the impacts of poisons. I mean, that, that's been your specialty. Mm -hmm. You're a toxicologist. 
here you're, you're editing this book, you're, you're going through all this scientific data. This has to be a million dead, the Chernobyl accident, the biggest technological disaster in the, frankly, the history of the world. It's true. How did you feel as you, you, you looked at the data and you put this book together? Well, I realized it was far worse than I thought it was. And um, that not only were um, people dying of cancer and heart disease, but every single organ in the body, whether it was immunological or lungs or cataracts or skin, everything was adversely affected. But not only people, every single system that was studied and not all were, but every system that was studied, whether it was humans or fish or trees or birds, bacteria, viruses, wolves, uh, cows, every system was changed. Every single system without exception. And this is reflected in, in this the book. It's not just human effects. Many of the birds and animals had similar adverse effects as humans. Now, most people aren't familiar with, I mean, we all know, I think, at this point that radioactivity and cancer go together, but like heart problems, heart disease, how, how does that connect? Well, the most, one of the most fascinating things that I learned in the, when I was uh, rewriting the text of the book and going through all the data was one of the scientists, Bandashevsky, had done a study and sh that showed that the cesium-137 levels in children were the same as he had found in test animals and were causing heart damage. He reported this, and for his work, he was put in prison. And he was put in prison? He was put in prison, yes. And he analyzed, uh, this, uh, these are animals that were... Well, he did the original study on animals, and then he was a pathologist, and he was studying the results in children, and he found the same changes in the hearts of children who had died as he'd seen in the animals. And when he reported it, he, his thanks was he got arrested and put in prison. The radioactivity from Chernobyl, Russia, Belarus, the Ukraine, these were three places where, I mean, a lot of the radiation was deposited. But according to this book, again, based on data, I mean, those poisons came down all over the world. Yes, they did. And the greatest concentrations came down in Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia. But the greatest amount, more than 50%, spread around the entire northern hemisphere, particularly uh, went north into um, Scandinavia and um, eastward into Asia. As far as China. Oh, yes. The book concludes, indeed, that the deaths as a result of Chernobyl occurred not just in Belarus, Russia, and the Ukraine, but, but all over. Oh, around the entire uh, the world, yes, of course. How long will this continue? I mean, some of the poisons that were discharged, they're going to be around for millennia. Oh, yes. I mean, just the two main ones, cesium-137 and strontium-90, have half-lives about 30 years, so they'll be around for three centuries at least, but many of the isotopes will be around for millennia. You're right. The book, however, stresses that the, the worst damage occurred in those early months, particularly those early weeks when the fire that, I mean, there was this huge fire that wasn't, I mean, they weren't able to put it out, was blazing. Well, yes, but still, the, right now, the, the reactor is leaking into the water supply. The structure that is around the reactor right now is not sound. And if there is so much as a mild earthquake, there's a chance of it collapsing. So this reactor is by no means uh, covered up or safe and not leaking. Now, this, this book, this, this, this book, Telling the Truth About Chernobyl was published by the New York Academy of Sciences, by the prestigious organization. What about the rest of, uh, 
I don't know, the scientific establishment. Uh, what's been their, how can I put it, stance, their position in getting this information out on Chernobyl? Well, some groups have been very um, interested in getting out the information, and people allied with the nuclear industry would just assume that nobody knew anything about what's in that book. How did Dr. Yablakov and the doctors Nestorenko embark on this, this journey with you of looking into the impacts of Chernobyl? Well, they have been aware of the WHO IAEA agreement, and uh, Actually, there have been people 24-7 outside of the WHO headquarters in Geneva trying to get this stopped, this agreement stopped. Have these people have been demonstrating? Demonstrating, yes. Picketing because of this agreement. Well, what, what, what the book describes as a collusive agreement between the IAEA and WHO. That's correct. Uh, Alexei Yablokov was a consultant to both Gorbachev and Yeltsin on the Chernobyl issues. And as you know, the data were covered up for about three years right after Chernobyl happened because the governments did not want anything to be known by people, and they collected almost nothing in the way of data. Alexei became interested in that and started collecting information. I think there's something like 150,000 publications that have come out, and they utilized well over 5,000 in writing this book. Many of the, res of the sources in here have never been translated in English, mostly were in the um, languages of Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus. So this is entirely new information that has not been uh, available to uh, the Western world. You talk about the impacts on people, on animals, on plant life. Are the mechanisms different? No, the, essentially the mechanisms are the same. Um, exposure to these radioactive isotopes are taken up by plants, are taken up by birds, taken up by humans, and damage the cells, kill some of the cells, damage the DNA, damage the genetic mechanisms of uh, species. Now, if it kills a cell, then it's not going to go on to cause cancer. If it damages a cell, it can go on to cause cancer or a birth defect in a human, a bird, or even, add, uh, quote, birth defects in plants. Plants have been altered by Chernobyl. Now, you, you just mentioned how the consequences were a lot to the Northwest because the winds were blowing towards, of all places, Scandinavia, uh, yes. The lapse, I mean, people who had nothing to do whatsoever with, with Chernobyl or nuclear power, they got hit. Uh, there, were, there was rain and there was fallout and, 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 and so forth. Uh, speak about those consequences. Uh, they have, a recent study has come out shown that, ch uh, that children born in Scandinavia uh, at the time when the Chernobyl fallout occurred are less likely to graduate from high school. They have intellectual impairment. Probably the most serious consequence of Chernobyl that I'm aware of is that only 20% of children in Belarus are considered healthy. That means that 80% of the children in Belarus are not well compared to the data that they have of children before the Chernobyl accident. And they're medically not well, and they are intellectually below par. How, how would that, what would be the, uh, the relationship there between radioactivity and a, a deterioration of intellectual capability? Well, while a mother is pregnant, she is eating food, and what happened was that most of the people didn't, either did not know or they did not have access to food that was not contaminated. These isotopes are taken into the body while a woman is pregnant. They are transported through her body to the unborn and damage the, the heart, the lungs, the thyroids, the brains, all of the tissues, the immunological system of these unborn. These children are born unwell, low birth weight. There was a very high uh, fetal death rate as a result of these exposures. This is probably the greatest tragedy that could occur to a, a, a culture. After the accident from the Ukraine, which had been the breadbasket 
of the former Soviet Union, and it's where Chernobyl was and is. I mean, in fact, there's three units of the Chernobyl nuclear facility uh, still in operation. In any case, that food moved around. Well, this is a big, this is an extremely serious problem. How do you get enough food for people if the land is contaminated for three centuries? And not only are you worried about grains like wheat and rye, but, and, but you have to also worry about m mushrooms. Doesn't sound very important, but mushrooms are a very big part of the food supply in that area. And these are extremely contaminated. The book concludes, based on now available medical data, 985,000 people dead. Mm -hmm. The data, however, just covers 1986 to 2004. Is that, as we open the program, mentioning a million casualties, would that be essentially the number that became victims of Chernobyl? I believe that's correct, yes. That we will see that many. We know, for instance, that of the um, people who called the liquidators, these were the young men and women who were recruited largely from uh, military from countries all around the area to go in and try and put out the fires and contain the Chernobyl mess. 15% of them uh, have died. And now these were young men and women, not you know, we're talking 18 to maybe 30. Dr. Sherman, in terms of the amount of radioactivity emitted from the plant, there too, there's, there's a big discrepancy between what's revealed in this book and what's been acknowledged up to now. Absolutely, and we, if a small amount was emitted, then we have to conclude that, that low levels of radiation are extremely damaging. If large levels were emitted, then we have to uh, understand how much damage has been done. But we really don't know yet because nobody has been able to go in and find out what is actually left in the uh, reactor that is leaking into the groundwater. What does this say about the safety of nuclear power? I mean. The nuclear industry, the nuclear establishment, because of a lot of the nuclear industry involves government entities, uh, a push is on to revive nuclear power, to create a nuclear renaissance, to build many, many more nuclear power plants. What's the lesson of Chernobyl and that? I think the lesson of Chernobyl is that we should be very cautious before we push technology. I mean, we were told that there was no problem with the British Petroleum drilling in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, one th there is one issue of technology where engineers do certain things, but they don't understand the biology. They don't understand what is happening to life around these installations. And I think that Chernobyl is the biggest lesson of what has happened to all species that were contaminated, no exceptions. I mean, the book indeed talks about owls, and could you elaborate on some of the effects on, on animals? One of the, the scientists whose photograph is on the cover of the book is Tim Mousseau from the University of South Carolina. He's led about over 25 groups of scientists to um, the Chernobyl area, and they have studied insects and birds and animals and owls and all kinds of different animals as to what's going on. He said one of the trips he made that he suddenly realized there were no bees and there, were no, there was no fruit falling on the ground. And he realized there was no fruit falling on the ground because there was no bees that had pollinated the trees. So he is predicting, and this may indeed, indeed happen, that there could indeed be a complete loss of species around Chernobyl as a result of these uh, isotopes that are still decaying uh, that could wipe out entire species. You know, after all, it is a major bird transport area, a migration area. 
and we don't know ha what's happening when the birds come through, eat whatever they can find on the ground, and then fly on, dropping the berries further on uh, after they have left the Chernobyl area. The genetic impacts, I mean, radioactivity has an enormous uh, effect on genes. Speak on that. These are unlikely to be improved. Once you get a genetic defect, it becomes transmitted generation after generation after generation. So these defects that are occurring in humans, in birds, in plants, are unlikely to improve the species as they occur. What kind of genetic defects are you speaking of? Well, we're ta in humans, we're talking about brain defects, uh, heart defects, limb defects, children without arms, uh, hydrocephalic babies. In birds, we're, we're looking at changes in the feathers and in the beaks and in their brain size. We talk about bird brains. These birds are not as smart, and they're not going to be able to function as well as the birds that are not changed. We know that the plants have been changed irreversibly. You know, this is, this is not rocket science. We know where these isotopes go. We know that iodine goes to the thyroid. We know that strontium-90 goes to the bones and teeth, particularly of the unborn. We know that cesium-137 goes to the heart and to the muscles. This is not a mystery. And if we know this, we can we can predict what the adverse effects are going to be. And indeed, they turned out to be just that, and it's shown, proven in this book. This has to constitute one of the, well, the claim that just a few thousand, a few thousand people died as a result of the Chernobyl disaster, one of the biggest lies in history, no? Absolutely. And they've been able to get away with it. I mean, we, we need to put pressure on the WHO to be, and the United Nations to separate the WHO from the IAEA. Not just on the international level with the International Atomic Energy Agency and the World Health Organization. Here in the United States, the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has, too, tried to minimize the impacts of radioactivity. You're absolutely correct. And I can go back to the Atomic Energy Commission before the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I worked for the AEC at the University of California in 1952. That was my first job out of college. And if I could figure out, with my limited experience at that time and my limited education at that time, that radiation was harmful, then other people could figure it out. We have had secrecy and lies to the American public for decades about the effects of nuclear radiation. There have been cover-ups, there have been uh, falsification of data, there have been people who said, well, don't worry about a little str uh, strontium-90, don't worry about the tritium coming out of the plant. Uh, we know that davis Bessey almost melted within an inch of its containment as a result of uh, poor maintenance, and I believe it's just a matter of time before we have another nuclear uh, problem somewhere in the world, if not in the United States. Well, why? I mean, you were within the, the nuclear establishment way back. We're talking about a half century ago. Yes. Plus. I mean, it had to do with money? Does it have to do with, with promoting a technology that these people are connected with, the nuclear scientists. Why the lying? Why the deception? I think it has to do with many things. I think it's the, the, the money and the control is on uh, corporations who are promoting nuclear technology. But we also have enormous scientific uh, ignorance in this country, people who really don't understand biology. I think if I lined up 20 people in a, in, let's say, in a mall someplace and said, put your hand over your liver. I'll bet you half of them couldn't do it. And to, to, to explain to people what's happening with nuclear radiation, I think be, our educational system is so poor these days that children are not learning 
about biology and physics and chemistry. And it's essential because it's such a major part of our culture and our economy. As you plowed through all this data, the consequences of Chernobyl, did the experience back decades ago oh, connect in any way to what you were doing? No, oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, this has been known for decades. The adverse effects of radioactivity have been known for decades. This is not something that has just occurred in the last couple of years. I mean, scientists who have any knowledge whatsoever of physics can figure out where a isotope is going to go in a body or in a plant or in a bird. I mean, this is not mister, mysterious kinds of science. What does Chernobyl represent? I mean, we're talking a million dead. What does it represent in terms of oh, technological history or the current technological scene? What does it mean? I think it represents very strongly that we cannot depend on technology, nor we can, can we depend on humans who operate and design this technology, because the ultimate Failure is human failure, as happened at Chernobyl. But you're talking here about health consequences on, on the most massive of scales. Yes, indeed. Around the entire northern hemisphere. Wherever the, the fallout was, people ended up dead. They, they wound up dead, and they wound up with children who were grossly impaired intellectually and medically, and... This is going on. It hasn't stopped yet. It's still going on. Dr. Sherman, how can people get a copy of this book? Uh, they could contact me by email. I am toxdoc, T is in Tom, O-X, D is in Dorothy, O-C, dot J-S, at verizon.net. And uh, I hope to have information on how they can get copies of this book. Yes, I think it's very important at this time that people learn the truth about what happened as a result of the Chernobyl disaster. Thank you so much for, for doing this work, Dr. Sherman. This has been Enviro Close Up. I am Carl Grossman. Thank you for watching. And to get a copy of this or any Enviro video program, just visit our website at www.envirovideo.com. This program was taped on March 5th, 2011, six days before the nuclear disaster in Japan began unfolding. The clear lesson of Chernobyl and now the Japanese disaster, all nuclear plants should be shut down. They present a clear and present danger to life on Earth. No more nuclear plants should be built. Taxpayer subsidies for nuclear power must be stopped and we must embark immediately on an energy program of efficiency and full implementation of solar, wind, geothermal and other safe clean energy technologies which are here today and render deadly nuclear power completely unnecessary.